This is Sandy Mitchell, a Scot who made Saudi his home. A senior hospital worker respected and liked by his colleagues, a father who was building a life for his wife and son. A man the Saudi police insist is a bomber and a killer. Tonight, Sandy Mitchell breaks his silence for the first time since his release from prison last month and tells a disturbing tale of brutality and humiliation at the hands of his Saudi interrogators. I'd watch them smile and laugh while they're hitting me, spitting me, kicking me uh, and beating me with, the, with this axe handle and soles my feet. Sandy and other innocent men held with him were almost pushed over the edge. Times I wanted to uh, top myself, but that's the coward's way out. This is a story of torture and beatings told by the men who suffered. Saudi Arabia, an oil-rich desert kingdom where many Britons have well-paid jobs and enjoy a comfortable lifestyle. Sandy Mitchell was one of them, a chief anaesthetic technician at a hospital in the capital, Riyadh. He was happy and settled with his Thai wife, Noi, and young son, Matthew. But a car bomb on November the 17th, 2000, which killed another Briton, Christopher Rodway, was to turn their lives upside down. Out of the blue, Sandy was arrested. I was handcuffed, hooded, taken to a detention centre by the secret police. And the beating started almost instantly. It was, what do you know about the explosions? The Saudis were linking the explosion to a turf war, gangs of foreigners involved in bootlegging, selling illegal alcohol, a theory Sandy says was pure fantasy. He and other expats believed the bombings were being carried out by Islamic militants targeting Westerners. But it soon became clear that wasn't the story the Saudi secret police wanted to hear. One of the officers said to me, you'll either confess to these bombings or you'll go insane with the pain that we're going to inflict on you. And they were right in both accounts because I was practically mad by the time they'd, that they'd finished with me. I was kept awake for nine days, chained to the, the, chained to the door at my cell so I could not sleep or sit down. This went on all through the day. In the evening times, we, I was taken up, hooded, taken upstairs in chains to one of the interrogation rooms where the beatings would then progress to torture. The, the beatings started with punching, kicking, spitting, uh, and eventually progressed to hitting me with, with sticks. They had this ax handle, uh, and the, I was beaten on the soles of my feet. I was hung upside down uh, with chains on my ankles, chains on my wrists, and a bar pit placed behind my knees. I believe they call it a chicken position. So I was hoisted up, exposing the soles of my feet and my buttocks, and I was just beaten uh, continuously. The beatings were brutal and often. Sandy would sometimes pass out during the torture sessions. He decided desperate measures were needed to try and save himself from his tormentors. I pulled a screw out of the wall, about one inch screw, uh, probably a bit more than one inch. Uh, in my desperation, uh, I swallowed it, to, I put it uh, with, some, with some food. The idea was if I could cause some internal bleeding on myself, they'd have to stop torturing me. They'd have to get me medical attention and my embassy would get to find out what these people are doing to me. It didn't work. The torture continued with just one aim in mind. They did not want the truth. They didn't want the facts. They wanted a confession. What can I do? I'm human. There's only so much pain a man can endure. 
And the punchline came was when they said to me, uh, your wife is Thai, we can do anything we want to her, we'll send a car for her. By that stage, I would confess to anything. When you're facing the interrogation, were there any incidents where the Saudis made it clear to you that this threat of death by beheading was a very serious one? Oh yes, it was, it was constant. They are going to behead me. Um, you, get, you will confess or you'll go insane with what we're going to do to you. Um, so it, it was just a case of when, do I go, when does the insanity start? Because I was practically insane by the end of the, the, by the, end of the interrogation sent, uh, sessions. Uh, I, I knew I was going to be beheaded. I confirm and confess that I was ordered to carry out an explosion here in Riyadh, which took place on Friday the 17th of November, the year 2000. Bewildered and broken after nine days of interrogation, Sandy Mitchell confessed. Later, his humiliation was complete when he and two friends, Canadian Bill Sampson and Raf Shivens, a Belgian nurse, appeared on television. The image which I'm sure will continue to haunt you is you on television admitting to this crime, admitting to carrying out a bombing and admitting to killing somebody. What do you remember of that day when that confession was recorded? I was ashamed because they broke me. And I, I was just, I was ashamed because I did not want people to think that I was capable of killing another human being. Sandy had been convinced he would die at the hands of his torturers if he didn't confess. A trial was held in secret with his interrogator as the prosecutor and no defense lawyer. Sandy was sentenced to death by beheading and crucifixion. Executions, this one was filmed in a public street in Riyadh, are still carried out in Saudi Arabia, although no Westerner has so far paid the ultimate price. This brought no comfort to Sandy. The torture was to continue even though he'd confessed and had been found guilty by the Saudi court. It seemed his interrogators were happy to hand out beatings for no other reason than they could. I'd watch them smile and laugh while they're hitting me, spitting me, kicking me, uh, and beating me with the with this axe handle and soles of my feet. The fact that they took pleasure in that is beyond comprehension. I've just never known anyone to be so evil in my life. Perhaps I've had a sheltered life, but I've never known anyone like that. After his nine days of interrogation, Sandy was moved to this prison near Riyadh. When I was transferred to Ohio prison from the interrogation centre, I was, uh, I was asked to sign a document which stated that the injuries to my body were inflicted prior to my transfer to Ohio prison. I had no problems about that because it was obvious. So my feet were red raw and grossly deformed. My buttocks were completely black. Uh, I have broken teeth, which I still have, and I haven't been able to, to get repaired yet. Sandy was kept isolated from the outside world. He didn't know if the British government were aware of his plight or if they were doing anything to help him. It would be six weeks before he was even allowed to see a British representative. When my consul came to see me, it was in the presence of my interrogators and I was warned, you say nothing to the, to the embassy or to your family about what, what we've done to you or anything about the case. Otherwise, we start all over again. So I, I could not uh, tell my embassy at that stage what was happening to me. Sandy was put in solitary confinement, a cell where the light shone 24 hours a day and contact even with prison guards was kept to a minimum. But his torturers were still coming to visit him and Sandy saw only one way of stopping that. I was collecting my heart tablets, my beta blockers. I was taking half the tablet and keeping half. Now this went on for about a month, where I was, so I had a, like a month's supply of my beta blockers. And I took them all at once because I just wanted to end it and, and cheat them of the satisfaction of, of killing me. 
It was a determined bid to commit suicide, but it failed, and life in solitary went on. Were you managing to eat by this stage? Uh, I'd lost a lot of weight because I couldn't keep food down. Uh, the fear of going back up for more, more torture, I just I threw up before I, before I went upstairs, so I wasn't keeping any food down. I went from 97 kilos down to 66 kilos. You were mentally and physically completely isolated for 15 months. Yes. How do you cope with that? Was every day the same, or did you try and find a way of making the days pass so that you had some hope? I actually got to the extent where I'd just given up all hope, but um, for, the s for the sake of trying to pres preserve my sanity, I'd make up mental quizzes for myself, try to add and subtract to my head, and this was gradually diminishing to the point where I just can't do it now. Um, th uh, after a few months, I think it was, it was about after three months, I was allowed to get books. Because of the, the my diminished memory, I found that I could read a, I could read a book and get halfway through the book and my powers of concentration was completely gone. I'd forgotten what the, f the first part of the book was about. So I'd find myself going back and forward continuously. I just find it very difficult to uh, to memorize to, to, to memorize things. What Sandy didn't know was that another Briton, Les Walker, a maintenance manager at a Riyadh housing and hotel complex, who'd been living and working in Saudi for 23 years, was suffering the same fate. He too had denied any knowledge of the bombings, but had been forced to confess, and was now also in solitary confinement. 13 months in solitary is not good. It's not good. Not no, I, I, um, I thought I could stand my own company. I thought I liked my own company. After 13 months, <laughs> you don't like your own company. How did you get through it? How did you cope? I don't honestly know. Um, I don't know. Times I wanted to uh, top myself, but that's the coward's way out. Uh, I don't know how I survived that. After those months of solitary confinement, at long last there was some good news. You learned that you were moving into a cell with a friend, Sandy Mitchell. At last, you were to to have some company. How did that feel, that the move into the cell with Sandy? It was wonderful. Uh, it was my birthday, um, <coughs> March, March 12th, 2002. Um, they told me a few days prior to this that I would be moving in with somebody. They wouldn't tell me who, and they didn't tell me who. Um, uh, that day, on the 12th, they came in and they said to me, uh, get your gear together, you, you're going over to see Sandy. Um, that was wonderful. <laughs> it was good, great. Um, I'm sorry. It's OK. <laughs> no, take, take. Um, I got a shock when I seen him because he was, uh, he'd lost so much weight. He looked so drawn. Um, wow, well, we j we just talked all night long. Uh, we stayed up all night drinking tea and, and water because we run out of hot water. <laughs> um, all night long, just going through our experiences. Um, I was like a child. Fabulous. Leslie was emotionally wrecked. I then had to, I realised I had to be stronger mentally for the sake of propping up Leslie. He, he's a much older man. He's one of the kindest men I've ever known. And the fact that he was dragged in to, to this whole 
mess was absolutely 